it might be small in the beginning but then what you do is just you build that segment of the market and then you define yourself as the market leader in that segment and then you do the marketing thing and then you build that market and now you have like your 50 percent market share in it and that's going to be your starting point and then after a while you might be able to start expanding into other segments in that market i think that if you want to work with this approach then find your find your niche define yourself as a leader in the niche grow the niche hey it's rich here from the experimentation podcast today i've got a very special guest uh john ekman on the show uh john is one of the og people in the conversion space uh he founded conversion easter 13 years ago uh he's grown it now to 90 plus people uh, in Stockholm, Malmo, Sweden, and Oslo, and they service multiple um, large, well-known uh, companies such as uh, H&M, IKEA, and Spotify, and so forth. So, thanks for coming on the show, John, and uh, welcome on board. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's uh, exciting to be on a on a global podcast like this with my. Uh, what was once my very small company, now slightly larger, but it's, uh, it's, I'm glad I made it here. To be considered one of the OGs, yeah, I, that's, uh, <laughs> you say that, I, I don't know, well, but possibly, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I think any, anyone that's been doing it for more than 10 years is uh, in, this, okay, in, this, yeah. in this space, is, you know, considered pre- pretty well established, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, so look, you've got an interesting story about how you uh, got involved in CRO and, and, and setting up uh, the agency conversion Easter. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell me about how you how you got into into the um, into the space? Yeah, I. Uh, so what what we're going to be talking about today is I I've been doing this. Um, I mean, for um, now ten odd years, I've been doing my 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 presentations, and I I just had one yesterday, like like the basic introduction to to CRO, which I call data psychology and experiments. I did it for one of the cl- our clients that we have here in the in uh in stockholm the the electrolux brand and um and then they asked me how many times have you done this deck and i i think i'm probably getting closer to 300 times now for that single deck so 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 i i I talk uh, i talk a lot about like uh, a b testing and psychology and those kind of things but then i somewhere down the road i just thought about like i have this i started to write down a few of the principles that i actually i you know it was it was very internal i just kind of did things on instinct and 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 some of them seem to be working pretty well. And then I just collected it. Then I and I came to ten principles of, of uh, that we actually used in, in building the agency. And then I thought, oh, maybe there's also an interesting story in, in how I built the agency. Not only like the work that I do, but like how did we arrive? How did we come to the position where we are now? So then uh, when we had our little pre meet, I I thought maybe this is this is an interesting story I, I could share. So we're gonna I'm gonna have ten points. Or like I, I, I actually posted it as a, I at the at I was uh, previous weekend I was at the, the, uh, what I say now the conference formerly known as the Conversion Hotel yeah so I was there and yeah. they had an on conference day, uh, session and I posted my little note there on the board and I said, um, the ten secrets of building a stellar CRO agency so it's a little bit clickbaity kind of thing to see. Let's see if it, if it sticks. If it's something interesting, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, five minute abs, right? People think it's like uh, I've got the ten steps now. I'll I'll um I'll set up my agency and uh, go yeah. to the moon. Yeah, um, yeah, we're gonna go to the moon. Let me tell you a little bit of how before we go into those ten points, how I actually got into this yeah. space at all. Yeah, so I was uh, um, I was actually in the in the online gambling because uh, we were I worked for a company that did casino software online casinos yep. and i went to one of these conferences in in um, in london i think this was 2007 and um i saw a guy called tim ash which also is considered one of the ogs in this business he, he wrote the first uh, book called landing page optimization one of the really early books in the space and he was a host he was a guy that started conversion conference so uh, i saw him on stage and he was doing this amazing uh like uh, live critique of websites and you can move this take away that there's too much contrast there there's too little contrast and you should a b test it so he was just basically ripping away on this uh, new cro a b testing stuff which i had never heard about and then i just i just i immediately thought to myself like wow this is this is this is a real business this is like somebody's working on this and 
and um, uh, and it's nobody is doing this in Sweden. I, I have never heard about this. Mm. And I then I also thought like in a hubris uh, moment there, like I I could be the guy that does this in Sweden. So I basically on the floor there said to myself, I'm going to be this guy in Sweden. And then I, I more or less later on then founded Conversionista. I put you need to put in like five thousand dollars to start the company. I bought a plane ticket. I bought a conference ticket to a conversion conference. The first one in in San Jose, uh, California. And uh, I bought a computer. Then the money was gone. Uh, but I figured I just couldn't. I couldn't. Um, like I, I ha- if I wanted to be the best, I had to learn from the best. So I just had to go where the best were. So I went to the first conversion conference, even though it was like incredibly expensive for my for my budget at the time. But <laughs> at the at the roundup, at the you know Tim, he likes to host a, a, a nice after party in his suite. So I went there and I. I, I spoke to him for the first time and I said, I said, Tim, I'm going to be you in Sweden. And then he said, you can't wow. do that, man. There's only one, ma- there's only one me back off. And, and he basically, <laughs> he was not, he was not joking. That was uh, like, yeah, that was funny. Are you serious? So, yeah, I was serious. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, and I was a little bit shocked. I was like, yeah, sure. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. That can only be one Tim Ash. So uh, then the year after that, I went back and then I, uh, then I met Brian Eisenberg for the first time, who's considered to really be the, uh, like the grandfather of of CRO, as he's called, and and then he um, he introduced me to some people there as being the the Brian Eisenberg of Sweden. Like does he just rip <laughs> took it out? And then apparently I could be no, I couldn't be Tim, but I could be Brian. And then on the third year, I made like just one of one of the things that I also did. I set a goal for myself. The third year, I mm-hmm. said I'm going to go back as a speaker, and uh, so wow. I, I pitched hard to to come back as a speaker. I did that. And then at the after party, I again met Tim and I told Tim the story. And then he said, oh, you can be me too. That's cool. So then I was officially the Tim Ash and the Brian Eisenberg of Sweden. But then like the, <laughs> the real, the real, uh, uh, what I said, the real um, the happy ending of, of this story now, well, happy m- middle part of this story is that I w- so I'm hosting my own conference as well. It's, we call it the Conversion Jam. So we've been doing that for uh, quite a few years. We get about uh, 700 people in stock. I mean, we have 300 in Oslo. And um, yeah. Uh, and we're actually rebooting it now after the pandemic. So we're going to do it next fall uh, for after a three year stop or pause. And then um, as I was, I was at the kind of after party in Stockholm after the third conversion jam, I, I remember a tweet I wrote, which was uh, something like I've been, I've been posting like this and that guy of, uh, uh, of Sweden now for a couple of years. But today I realized I only have to be the John Ekman of Sweden. Uh, so th- I felt like wow. after three years, I, I I reached that position of being that person who I who I wanted to be, and it actually ties into the to the first of my points in my in my little uh, ten point list. This is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. Every week, we share interviews with and conference sessions by our favorite conversion rate optimizers from around the world. So if you like this video, smash that like button and consider subscribing. It helps us a bunch. Now back to the episode. <laughs> It sounds like you, these two guys were idols, idols and after a three-year period, you sort of came full circle yeah. and um, felt comfortable in your own shoes that you, uh, instead of being the new uh, Tim Ash, um, you're, you're, the, you're John Ekman. You're, you're yeah. the one and only John, John Ekman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you um, obviously have had, had a very successful agency um, over the 13-year period, and I think you said you sold it to the art group. Could you tell us uh, a bit more about that? So this is a little bit about how I, why I sold the company. What did I want to achieve with this, and how did I find a, a good solution for that? So I, it, it, when you do the when you do this thing, it's like you really need to figure out what is it that motivates you, and uh, what is that yeah. you want to get out of it. And I, the way that I felt, <clears throat> I'm a I'm a I'm a crafts person. I'm a I'm a geek. I'm I like Google Analytics. I like user testing. I like the all the behavior design principles and all that. I'm uh, I'm not very good at um, I'm not very I'm not a very good manager. I, I'm I'm I get tired and bored of accounting and HR and office space and all those stuff that you need to take care of when you're the CEO. So, uh, so so one of the things people tell me like, like you also did today actually <laughs> this morning, Joe, you're the CEO of the company. No, I haven't been the CEO for almost like ten years. I think I haven't been the CEO for like eight years or something. So uh, yeah. when already. And that's actually that ties into the point number nine in my list that know your limits. And so when the company was only when we were only five people, uh, I got an external CEO to the company. So 
uh, I realized that I've never been the manager for more than five people in my entire life. So that's kind of my limit, I guess. So I just thought that yeah. if I want this company to be bigger than uh, five people, then uh, I, I need to get somebody on board as, as the CEO. And then, um, so I did. And then we also, when we, when we then started to, to grow in a, in a faster pace, we reached, we reached kind of the next limit. So we were 25 people. And um, there was this guy, Matthias. He wanted to, he wanted to buy Conversionista like forever. We, we met like yearly um, for, every, for every year before that and then for, for, for five years. And he was trying to buy me every year. And I said no, because I, he had this kind of general digital agency called Curamando. And I couldn't really see like what made them different from all the other digital agencies. But I had this unique asset of like having the top brand in CRO in, in the Scandinavia. So I, I figured like I'm, I, I got the, I'm the I, ha I hold a winning hand here. But then when, mm. as time went along and, and they every year we met, he had grown, even though he was just, I thought, in my opinion, like a bland digital agency. And I was like super niche, uh, uh, competitive offer. He still grew much faster than I did every year. So I figured I yeah. it's like I don't know what they're doing, but it seems like the proof's in the pudding. And also they they just had a very different approach. I was just a, I, I I grew my business through the craft. I, I was I positioned ourselves as the good best craft people and then all the other things around it happened and we grew. And Matthias did it pretty much um, the other way. He's like, I want to build this machinery uh, uh, that that is uh, that is behind the agency that helps it grow. And whatever we put into the machine, what kind of services and stuff we put in there, it's like, oh yeah, we'll figure that out from time to time. That's actually not the important part. And I just thought it was a, like a very good match because we had a very complementary skill sets. And then as I um, as we did this, I, I also asked myself the question, like, because I, I wanted longevity in the conversionista brand. I, I I wasn't interested in in selling it just to make a buck. Uh, so I figured, yeah. like, is this the is this a context where? where I, I can find a home for this brand to keep growing. And also I asked the second question, I looked at the people around the table and I asked myself, are these the people that I'm going to be working with for like for the rest of my career? Cause I seriously don't think uh, I'm 57 now. I, I don't think once this is like finished, whenever that is, I don't think I'm going to do anything else. So, so then I, I just uh, asked myself those two questions. And then as we, we communicated the transaction, a lot of people came to me and they were like, they called me and like, yeah, what did you just do? It's like, you should have talked to me. I could have paid more. And, and, and people were upset. They were not allowed into, into buying my company. But then I mm -hmm. was like, then I had to tell them like, I'm, I wasn't first and foremost financially motivated. I was just motivated to create a future for my, for myself and create a future for my company. And, and of course it was also financially successful, but that was the, it came kind of secondhand for me. Wow. So it sounds like you were, you you had a good sort of complementary um, sort of skills there. He was. It yeah. sounds like he, he was good at building systems and scaling uh, companies uh, from a business perspective. But you were good at the actual. You had the craftsmanship and yeah. the sort of um, the care and the the, the the attention to detail and the quality involved in you know the art form of CRO, so to speak. Yeah. And combining those two helped you know helped you to grow bigger overall. Yeah, and and we, sound, we've now sound accurate. Yeah, absolutely, and and then so that that was the starting point. We were twenty five, and they were fifty, so we were seventy five people. That was now in August uh, five years ago, and now we have sixteen agencies. We also have two agencies in the Netherlands. We're twelve hundred people, um, so so it became like the starting point of a, of a much bigger journey. And and so like officially, my role now is I'm the chief of Angus in the Arc Group, and then I also jump in and do all kinds of things with with conversionista when they need when they need this uh, founder to come out and do his presentations and inspire the <laughs> the people in around us. inspire the crowd yeah, yeah that's that, yeah. that's uh that's good you still still got your yeah. hand in the game um so uh yeah you mentioned the 10 uh secrets of building a, a stellar CRO agency and i think mm. Um, a lot of people will be excited to hear, um, you know, your wisdom there, especially uh, those who are a bit more entrepreneurial or right. uh, if they've been working in a CRO agency environment for a while and maybe want to set up their own um, agency. So, um, yeah, could you run us down through the, uh, yeah, the 10 points? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that, like, uh, there are actually probably some other things which 
most of us would consider even more important, right? But uh, they are they are general, so they would you would find them in yeah. the top ten tips to to build a, a company or you know just uh, so so I basically try to, to take out the parts which are somewhat unique to to what I did, and and I I um I divided them into three categories: how to communicate to the market, how to communicate with prospects, and how to build a company. And uh, I, mm-hmm. I think my then if we start with how to communicate to the market, I. Uh, the first thing I did was, you know, when when I said to myself, "I'm going to be this uh, Tim Ash or the <laughs> Brian Eisenberg of Sweden," I I basically yeah. that I said that to myself, but then I immediately told it to everybody else. So I I pitched myself as a presenter at conferences, and and uh, I told everybody, I told them the story. Like the first couple of slides I had in my presentation was the story about going to 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 San Jose, meeting Tim Ash, meeting Brian Eisenberg, that kind of stuff. And I told everybody, my goal is to become this guy of Sweden, in Sweden. So now, so now I, as I did that, I basically tied myself to the mast because it's like, because I made an external commitment, I, I was going to do this. Yeah. I also had to go and do it. It was like a failure was not an option. So, and everybody knew, I myself knew my goal. I had told it, told it to everybody and everybody knew about it. So now I just had to go and do it. So I, I couldn't backpedal on that one. So that was a... Uh, that that I think was a, like my first important principle. I, I at the time I just did it because I I don't know to be honest I don't know why I did it. <laughs> I just uh, I, I I I guess I'm a transparent guy and I made this commitment to myself and then I just told everybody else like uh, uh, I do with most of the stuff about me. So so but then I realized it was actually quite important in the in in the journey to to have this external goal and to have everybody see it. And do you think that? Um... Uh, did you see? I, I've heard of the um, uh, there's a certain power in, in declaring external goals and telling everybody because it keeps you accountable. And if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then um, you know people would probably think you're a flip flop or yeah, you know you're not you're not serious. So do you think that um, by by uh, telling everybody that sort of created a, a kind of an external pressure to do what you were going to do? Social pressure, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it worked for me. I, I, I mean, I didn't find it in any management book or anything. Like it just kind of like everything now. It's, it's, it's kind of weird that I'm, I'm, I've been preaching this data-driven, experiment-focused uh, business now for ten years, and then I'm now going to, yep. I'm going to tell you ten things that are that they're all like gut feeling stuff <laughs> because it's just things that I did. <laughs> it's just things that I did instinctively without really knowing why I did it. But then it turned out like years later oh this shit actually worked it's like uh who, who would have um, known but <laughs> <laughs> well i guess i guess that's the human part of you right like i mean we do the data analysis at work yeah, and sometimes yeah. the you know the intuitive uh human sides uh, yeah. gotta come out eventually um so what's uh what's the other uh i think you had that point two was side of your yeah. clients we feel your yeah, pain. So, what's, yeah what's yeah yeah so, so number two side with the clients we feel your pain i th- i think a lot of a lot of uh companies People, agencies, whatnot, are a little bit afraid of talking about problems, so they want to be solution oriented. Yeah. Like, let's not talk about problems. Let's like, like, let's talk about how we can help you, and and that basically skips the part of like, what is that? What is actually the problem we're trying to solve here? And then um, uh, we have our mission statement is we have come uh, to save humans from digital experiences that suck. I can add this to the show notes <laughs> as well. And then. So I thought it was like, really funny, to be honest. Yeah, the, the last word there is the word suck. It's like, and what sane uh, company would put the word suck in their mission statement? It's like, it's, it's like you don't do that. That's way too negative. But I, I think that what, um, what, what, ha- what happens there is that you, you side with your clients. It's like, it's empathy. It's like, we feel your pain. We, it's, it's not that, it's not that they, they were, they, they're walking around thinking their websites are stellar. And then we come and tell them yeah. they, they suck. It's like, they they feel the pain. It's like, oh yeah, this thing, this beast, this monster we created, it's leaky. It's like we're not getting as much many conversions out of it. And and this is it's this horrible CMS that is like it, it takes like eight master's degrees to even figure out how, how to update a image and and, <laughs> and 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 then and then we're basically saying like, yeah, we feel your pain. We know that stuff too. We're in the same boat here. So I, I think one of the things we've did with we're we're all in, in the same boat. And uh and um, and and I know that there are some conference organizers that they basically turn me down because they're like we can't just have this like 
rogue Jon Ackman on stage because he's going to do these rants about websites that suck. It's like we can have that. They, they might be people in the audience that he's ter- he's yep. doing a teardown on their website, and then they're going to be pissed with us. But I've I've done <laughs> I, I've done this quite a few times, and then basically people come to me afterwards to say like, oh yeah, I'm from this company job. This was so great. I actually, you know what? I made a video because I'm going to show this to my boss because finally somebody externally is giving a voice to all the pain we're feeling. So like, thank you so much, John, for doing that because now finally my boss might listen to me because he saw he's going to see this on tape with you. So that was, that was actually, I, it has worked out really, really well for us. And, and a, a little bit, I, I didn't see the mechanics of it first, but then I understood it. It has to do with empathy and 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 being in the same boat. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I mean, empathy has been something that's been talked about a lot in um, you know companies last I don't know maybe five ten years. You know, having empathy, putting yourself in people's shoes, and yeah. uh, it sounds like you just sort of did this intuitively, right? You didn't like read yeah. a, a book on like. No. you know, empathizing with your clients, but you, yeah. you just put yourself in their shoes. You were like, okay, I know your CMS sucks or I know your landing page isn't the, the, the most optimized or whatever. And um, yeah, just sort of, uh, instead of jumping to this solution, you just sort of, you, you could say how, well, like I know yeah. what it's like to be, yeah. you know, have a crappy First, CMS or, yeah. or platform or whatever. Yeah. In, in order to, in order to understand the solution, you first need to, you need to know the problem is that I, I got a, I got a friend who he works in B2B sales and, uh, and yeah. he says like that your only job is like, if you're selling, if you're selling plugs, right? The, the only thing that you need to do is that you re- need to define the hole in which the plug will fit Perf- It's like, you need to communicate with the client. What is the exact shape and size of this hole? And once you have, once you're done in that communication process, then you bring out the plug and look, it fits perfectly. So don't talk about the plug, talk about the hole. I think it's a really good analogy yeah. Yeah. Uh, for our audiences. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't talk about the plug, talk about the hole. Yeah. Um, and you've got another one on thought leadership first. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, business model, business model second. What's what's yeah, that? Yeah, so 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 basically number three. <coughs> and also that that was actually um, that that's actually something that I re- that was that that I had in my mind already from the beginning. That was a very that was like uh, something that I really went for. I didn't discover it in, in hindsight. Uh, but I thought like this, I'm going to build thought leadership. I'm going to be this person that people consider like the Mr. Conversion, whatever, of Sweden. So, and, and, I, yeah. and, 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 and I did that. So when, when the, the topic of the conversion came up in some business uh, magazines and blogs and things like that, people would normally reach out to me and ask me, what is your opinion on this thing? We saw this blah, blah, blah with Klarna, whatever. What do you, what do you think about that? And, and then I thought, like, so if I build this position as the thought leader, uh, then I can build pretty much any business in the space based on that foundation. So it could be an agency, it could be a product, it could be like a solo speaking career, it could be like the author, you know, the, I, I basically didn't know so much in the beginning what kind of business opportunity I was going for. I was basically thinking, like, let's, let's build a thought leadership first. Because that's going to put me in a position where I, I'm going to be able to choose the direction of my business, and then it, it turned out that I that I came into the agency model pretty just. Um, I think I did it. Be, it. That's just more or less availability bias. It was like the easiest thing to do. It's like you're a you're a, you're a public person. People see you speaking, and then they want some help, and they say, "Yeah, I can I can help you." And then all of a sudden, your agency starts growing. And uh, so the, so, but that wasn't. I'm not really sure that's really what I was aiming for, uh, but I, I was just le- like, get me on the stage and then we'll figure out the other stuff uh, later, more or less. <laughs> Again, intuitive. So you didn't have a grand plan that, you know, I'd, I'd create this thought leadership. It would be like, set me up from, it would set me up as an authority in the space. And then yep. that in itself would be a lead generation. That, that, that yep. wasn't on your the top of your mind, but that's, it sounds like that's what it basically turned into in, 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 in yeah. effect, mm-hmm. like, it sounds like you got a lot of leads and sales, uh, so to speak, out of out of being on stage or people reading about you in a book or yeah, magazine yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and I, I think so. And and then it, then that actually that actually leads to the fourth point, which is I uh, I call that one marketing led sales second. And mm-hmm. and basically in this kind of space, you build the market, I build the market, and uh, and and I think that's uh, that's also. 
And so when I, when I was doing this, I was basically just creating so much upper funnel awareness about the, about the topic. So uh, we usually, we, we kind of prided ourselves that uh, up to that point when we sold the company, which was like seven years into its, uh, into its history, we still didn't have salespeople. So when the company was 25, zero salespeople. Like, yeah, we, so we, at, when we were 25, we did not have a single like uh, salesperson. Uh, because basically all we did was marketing. So, so, so we were, we were building the market the, the market didn't exist. Uh, and then I went out there, I, I started speaking, I started blogging, I started to create awareness about this topic and, and only yeah. mostly just marketing, 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 uh, awareness, awareness, awareness. And then, then what happened is that, uh, when we, when I was there, it's not like I went on stage and then I walked off, people rushed up with a business card and wanted me to do business with them. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was more or less basically a building an awareness and, and people, they didn't have the budget. They did like, they couldn't get the attention of, of the CEO. Uh, and they, yeah. there were all kinds of things stopping it. So basically they were, they thought like, this is something really cool, something I should do, but maybe a bit into the future because we're not prepared to do it right now. And basically, we were not we were not shaking that tree at the time. We we're just sitting under the tree and just waiting for the kind of apples to fall down at when they were mature enough. So we were, and there there was just enough apples falling into our lap all the time. And 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 it's also, I, I think that it worked when you're the market when you're market leader. I I think it's it is kind of weird that we are now ninety plus people, and I think our you know I'm I'm not really sure, but I think our biggest competitor in Sweden. Is I think maybe still not above the ten people mark. I uh, uh, I so, so we're basically very dominant in in this uh, in this market in, in Scandinavia and and uh, so when you have such a great market share, then it really pays off mm -hmm. to build the market. It's like you don't have to focus on extracting a certain um, a, a certain wedge, a certain percentage of the market. It's much smarter to build the market because if you have like a fifty percent market share then half of the business you create is just going to fall into your lap. And, and I think that if, I, if I'm advising people that are now coming into this space or any other space, yeah. uh, they, they are not in this uh, fortunate position that I was in because I was very early in the market. But I'm yeah, thinking I was like, going to ask you. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, but I'm thinking like if you're, if you're, when you're entering in a, a new market, then it, uh, the only thing you have to do is just, just have to find this market segment. You, ha you just have to define a market There's a lot that you still have to get their attention. There's a lot of noise out there, but you're, there are still ways, there are avenues to reach like that buyer. So in other words, um, you were there at the start when CRO experimentation was not even a thing in people's minds. You had to uh, create the market. And I guess yeah. that took a lot of education of the market. Um, whereas if someone was to start now, um, there's a lot more market awareness uh, of of what CRO is and so forth, and so for them, their journey might be a bit different to yours, where the market's already there. They just need to maybe niche down a bit more, like say yeah. instead of just saying we do CRO and we do for ever for everybody. Um, yeah, you do CRO for B two B. You do CRO for apps. maybe do CRO for I don't know Shopify stores or yeah. SaaS yeah. companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I can I can see I can see the, how they can create it, their own segment. In a, in a market that's, um, you know, fairly mature, uh, compared right. to when you started. Yeah. Um, so that segues to, uh, the, the second point you've got, the second area you've got, which yeah. is how to communicate with prospects. Um, yeah. can you run us through those points? Yeah, sure. So, 
uh, when we were communicating with prospects, I, we have basically had uh, we had um, two we had two principles. Uh, this was also very um, this was this was fairly explicit. This was like a, an explicit strategy that that we work with, and um, and I have to say I owe it to the Magnus, the, the CEO. Uh, that uh, that I brought in because he had been working quite a lot with uh, with sales and he was he was very seasoned in this area so I think he was the one that that came with these principles to the company so I, I should credit him and the first one is we, we say like never say no to the customer to or to the prospect and typically when you're growing and uh, you start with you start with smaller clients you start with like uh, SMB companies and then you're moving up the the kind of the, the food chain to to as as now we are working with H and M and IKEA and so on, and um, uh, and then when you do that, uh, we are now at the point where we are we are basically selling, you know, we are selling selling bigger chunks of, of of what we're doing. Like we could do uh, previously, we could do like a a um, twenty hour gig on this and that thing, uh, but now we're saying like the, the minimum you can buy from us is like a full time person for three months or something like that. So, and that's that's yeah. not that's not because we're uh, because we're, uh, you know, we're stuck up or cocky and think we're the best in the world. It's just basically when you have a bigger company, you know, the pieces in your in your staffing puzzle needs to be bigger. If you have all these, like, if you have ninety people and then you have like a million uh, uh, pieces in your puzzle, it just becomes uh, like it just doesn't work. You need to you ha need to have bigger chunks because otherwise you just stress people out. You get poor quality in the delivery to the clients and all that stuff. So, but then when, when when once you have reached this position, then a lot of smaller clients are coming to you, and you're you're having a first like uh, qualifying call with them, and then you realize oh there's no way they're going to buy our services; it's just too expensive for them. But then then yeah. do you have to say no to that customer? So the, what we have done is like we basically created a, a um, kind of a ladder for this. I can also share this in the show notes. So basically, if you yeah. have zero, if you have zero money, you have absolutely nothing. Then we can help you. But you can you can check our blog out. You can check our newsletter out, and and you can come back and you can get free zero tips on a on a biweekly basis. And uh, and here are also you know here are some other links. Here's a book where I think this is really good. Uh, I think you check check out this site because they do some good work too. So sorry that you don't have a budget, but uh, here are some tips you can work on. And then if you have Let's say that you have uh, four hundred dollars. Then you can send one person to the conversion jam uh, yearly, right? So, so one person can come and be inspired at our conference for for a four hundred dollar ticket every year. Okay. Uh, let's say that you have a um, let's see you now what is it? It's a fourth. You have four thousand dollars. Okay. Then you can send yeah. one person to our conversion manager training program, which is a a, a training program that does uh, nine full days of learning the. Um, learning how to be, be successful in CRO, like A to Z, uh, you learn about data, you learn about uh, psychology, you learn how to, to set up experiments and an experimentation program and so on. So uh, if you have that kind of budget, well, then you're, you're good to go. And then finally, if you have $40,000 and above, then you can actually become like a, a client for our services. So this is for, has for us been a way of saying like the, the, the money in the, in the lower parts of this uh, ladder isn't that isn't that great? But it basically we never have to say no to anybody, and and the good part, which then ties into the uh, second point in this section, uh, number six, is to see the person, not the company, because the people that don't have the money right now, they go, to, they read your blog, they go to your training, they go to your conference, and you know what? A couple of years later, because they learned so much in the space, and and we help them to do that, they have this great loyalty. And, and perception mm. of a brand. So then all of a sudden they get hired by a big company and, and, they, and they think back about uh, like, who should I hire in this space? And they naturally come back to us and then become a buyer of our services. So you didn't just like, it's like, you know, a typical sales call, you pre-qualify them, have a little 10 minute discovery call. And I'm guessing for CRO agencies would be like, okay, do you have enough money and do you have enough traffic? And if they probably didn't have yeah. either of them, then yeah. instead of just ruthlessly disqualifying them and saying, okay, goodbye, you still trying to keep the conversation and just gave them like a kind of like a stepladder approach. Like where yeah. if they couldn't afford this service, maybe they could afford the tr the internal training or if they can afford that and then maybe conversion jam or 
even if they couldn't afford anything at all, then I guess they could just go on your blog and then yeah. by doing these things, by going down the, 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 the value ladder, so to speak, and still giving them value, um, it created this internal goodwill because I guess at the end of the day, you're, you're, yeah. you're communicating to humans, not just uh, faceless companies. And so That's that like- person that may have come back to you when they, I don't know, went to another company, like you said, yeah. a bigger company, or if that company grew somehow um, yeah. over the years, over say a period of years, and we're able to get the, you know, get you on board, um, then yeah, they would be probably first in line to, to be chosen, right? Right. Yeah, I, I can tell yeah. you a, be- a beautiful story about a, about a guy. I, I'm I just, uh, to keep it anonymous, I'll just give him another name. Let's, let's call him Christopher. And he was, uh, he was like the yeah. e-manager of a big uh, sports store here in the, uh, around Stockholm. And then he kept mm-hmm. um, he kept emailing me. He's like, John, I you know I, I noticed this like weird thing in Google Analytics. I don't know. Like, do do you have any idea what this could be? And then like, what what was this book again that you gave a tip about? So he just kept coming back to me, and, and we had a couple of qualifying meetings, and we we understood that yeah, he just he, it was a it was a single it was a big sports store, and they had a website, but it was like only one store. So it was they they were very big for being only one store, but they were still not you know a big player so this went on for years and and we kept hearing from him every now and then and we basically never said no it, it took a, a bit of time and and to be honest uh, perhaps a little bit annoying uh, at times but then he cha- <laughs> but yeah but then he but then he changed jobs you know and we had a friendly relationship and then he became like the e-com man- e-com manager of like a really big um uh, outdoor bicycle uh well, like the probably the biggest one in sweden uh and then mm. and like guess who he calls like on the on the first day of his job uh, and then and then basically we, we started a project with them because he now uh had finally the budget that he had been hoping for and now he could all do these cool things that he wanted to do but never had the money yeah. so so it was it was a really it was a really nice story and that then that, that's actually that's that's how I understood uh, that explicit story uh, helped me understand what we had implicitly been doing for years and the value of what ha- we had been doing. That's uh, that's an inspiring story and and a uh, very tangible story. But like you know how you just like, for, of course he probably was a little bit annoying sometimes, and you're probably thinking, okay, I'll, I'll email this guy even though he's not a customer <laughs> <laughs> and help him out. But uh, I guess, like, you know, it pays off. And, like, look, not, not everyone's going to buy off you. Some some people might consume your content and never become customers. But I guess, uh, yeah, that's a very good um, very good point. Um, now the third uh, and final area is how to build the company. Yeah. Um, can you start off with uh, your points there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the first one in this section, I call it uh, number seven Then we're at. Is build a company where you would like to be a customer. Let's put it this way: don't build a company uh, to be the kind of company you hate. And uh, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the inverse. And 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 one of these. There's uh, no there's no need for more companies that you hate. Uh, <laughs> no, no, plenty no, of no. companies that I hate. Yeah, so. yeah, it's like I don't need plus <laughs> one on that one. No. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, I um. Uh, the, the way I think about it, it's like one of the things that I hate personally. I, I mean, other other people might might like this, but I just really don't like it when a company comes to me and says, like, uh, John, we got this new kind of AI powered thing, black box here that's going to do like all these like marketing tricks for you. And, and you know, yeah. how it works is like, don't bother your little uh, marketing P brain with this because it's uh, because we figure the shit out and, and you're just going to have to... <clears throat> Um, uh, pay a license fee and it do all the magic without you having to worry about it. I just I don't like that. I'm I'm an engineer to begin with, and I like to understand how things work. As so that if I mm. if I'm going to deploy this thing in my business, I want to know how it works. I mean, I don't have to know the details, but the principles and and I this this kind of black box approach, I just really don't like it. I there's just too much opportunity for somebody to hide some some bullshit away from me and and try to pretend it works when it doesn't. And uh, so I just basically, I never buy stuff like that. So then I uh, then when I built my company, I said like, we're not gonna do it like that. I, we're, we are going to be fully transparent. People will be able to uh, like open the hood and, and see how the engine works. And, and we'll have full transparency in, in everything we do because basically what is it 
that I think we can gain from that. It's like, I don't know. It's like, I just want to build a company where I myself would want to be a customer. This is the kind of, this is the kind of agency. If I was in the, if I was on the buying side, this is kind of agency I would like to go to. And therefore that's what I'm going to yeah. do. And is it more profitable? Is it more successful? I have no idea, but it, it's just, that's just a, that's just a value judgment on, on that's, that's how I want it to be. If it becomes very small doing this, I don't care. It's like, it goes in another dimension. And then it turns out as, as one of the points that I had, I think it is actually one of the things that made us successful, but that wasn't, I, I didn't know that beforehand. It was just a gut feeling thing. I, I feel I want to do this. I'm going to do it. I mean, when you say like build the company where you like to be a customer, do you mean, um, you talk about transparency. Do you mean like, uh, I'm just thinking of a tangible example. Do you mean like, you know, share it like in terms of like reporting on your A-B test and so forth, like sharing, um, you know, uh, all available data on Google Analytics and... Um, I, I, I think what a key, I think a key component there is that let's have a tangible uh, example there again. We work for, for a big insurance company here in Sweden. So they, so we were yep. working, we had, I think we had two people, two consultants working there. Um, and then basically they wanted to insource that. They said like, it, it, you've helped us a lot, but it, you know, it's like we, your consultants, we can't afford you in the long run. So we need to transition yeah. to insources. And so how can you help us do this? And I said, okay, yeah. So you need two people. We can basically write the job descriptions for those people. Okay, fair enough. Okay, can you have, let's do that. Okay, so we write their job descriptions. So they post the job descriptions. They get they get a bunch of applications. So then we help them screen the applications to, uh, and then we got a, a number of people that do the interviews. And as a part of the interview process, we also do one of the interviews with the people. And then you finally we get we get two people that we sign. And then we put them on the conversion manager program to teach them how to do like to do the CRO thing. So, and then when all this was yeah. successfully done, we transitioned out of the client. So we, we help the client replace us. And, uh, and, and, and I think one of the transparency things is like, here's the, here's the machinery, here's how it works. Um, if you want to, mm. like, we want to, we want to take you on a journey where you can learn this. We, we understand that you cannot be dependent on us forever. So let's help you help yourself. In, in, in gaining knowledge and, and, and traction in this area. So that's, I think that, that, that would be one example of, of how we do this. And, and then you could, you could, you could also, you can always argue that, that, um, okay, but isn't that dangerous? Aren't you going to, you know, aren't you going to lose your, uh, your, your, your market? You're going to replace yourself with all clients. And I, I just, uh, um, it's also just one of these values, value things, right? I, I, that's mm. what I wanted. That's the kind of company I wanted to build. And now, and now, um, uh, more than ten years later, we seem to be like one of the biggest agencies globally in this uh, in this field. So it it couldn't have been all wrong. Like it's it's not an it's not an epic fail in in that sense. So we must have done something right. Well, I guess maybe there's some sort of complex feedback loop where say in this instance, you did help them to, to become self-sufficient and then word got out that, hey, you know, conversion East is really good. And then people, you know, people talking. And exactly. And, and also at the same client, you help them. And then they have these two people, they work there for a while. And then they need, they understand that they need this kind of expertise in another of their business areas. And then and they don't have the people there. And then we go to work with them again. Or actually one of these people quit. That, that actually happened. Yeah. One of them quit. And then... They need to, uh, like, we f when they are trying to get the new person, we went back and, and we filled that position for, I don't know, six or 12 months before they could get that person back in. So, so because, because of the mm. relation, you help them once and now, and now they know we are helpful and they come back when they have a new need. I think that's similar um, to point, uh, this point about building the company where you would like to be the customer. I think in some ways, it's similar to never say no to the customer. It's kind of in a sense that um, yeah, yeah. it's empathy based, right? Like, right. You're, yep. yeah, you're actually trying to understand them and, and um, say, hey, we care about you guys. Um, what's the yeah. other uh, got on your list? You've got number yeah. eight, which is stay true to the core. Yeah, stay true to the core. So, so one of the things that happened was that. Um, and we, uh, we often had these ideas we were getting into, like, for, for example, my, my, um, my first employee, Maria, she had an SEO background. So we're working, we're doing CRO. They also have some, some SEO need. So we can, 
do like an SEO audit while we were on it. We have a client, so it it's pretty it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty low hanging fruit to say like you know it's like you're sitting down, and you're saying you're ten people, and you say like you know for every single client almost that we have now, we they also say that they have a problem with this. So why don't we hire one yeah. more person that's dedicated to this area, and then we you know you know get some extra revenue. We can we can build a company like that to have like these auxiliary services or around the the core. But the problem was, was for us was that as we were pitching to clients, we were saying like, um, it, we, maybe the client would share with us that we're actually talking to this company. They told us that they can also do this. And then we would basically go, we would go and say like, oh yeah, you're talking to them. Yeah, they're actually really good. So they are, they're like a performance marketing agency with 30 people. And then they have like one person in CRO. And then, uh, you, uh, yeah, I think you should maybe hire that person because that person also took our conversion magic course, right? So it's probably somebody really, really good. So you should do that. Or you can go with a company uh, like us that has 30 people that at the core and has been doing this for like five or seven years. So you can just, yeah, you can choose any of those two. Like, yeah, you have, you have your pick, right? And then, so basically you're framing it your, your, to, to, uh, to the client that like, uh, that there's, they would be incredibly stupid to go with the, with a one man show instead of going with a 30 people company with seven years of experience. Right. So, and now, mm. if we would have added that SEO person or that yeah. CMS person or the WordPress person or the blah, blah, blah person, I don't know, then basically everybody could have turned the same argument against us, right? So, so we were, uh, our, like our dedication and our ability to steer clear of these, uh, these opportunities made it possible for us to continue this communication, uh, how we were the hardcore the top notch, top dog people that they should do business with. And and by doing that, like, you know, staying true to the niche and saying, we only do this, this is our specialty, yeah. that reinforces in the customer's mind that um, this is this is all you do. Like this is your your hard you know, you're 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 an authority in that space. I, I think I think it comes with a it kind of it comes with the territory. It's like if you're saying like we're the biggest and we're also only dedicated to this, then people w- with that people would assume like oh then you must be the best and 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 then yeah yeah so so it it, it, uh, it that they go hand in hand the other p- uh, point you've got got point nine we're almost at the end uh, is know your know limits, your limits? What's that? yeah so then i so we touched on that uh, in the in the beginning about when i talked about the exit that that i did with the company and uh yeah and i like i said i um I was, I've never been a manager for more than five people in my life. So already you know, when I, we were only five, I, I, I got a, I got a CEO. I, I gave him a, a, a sizable stake in the company, but I just figured if we together can grow this bigger, faster than the stake I gave away to him, then it's still a zero sum game for me. So I think too many people don't realize what they're good at and what they're not good at. And, and I was possibly a little bit lucky because when I did this now, 13 years ago, so I was, I had some. I, I've, I, I've done some things previously, so I learned a little bit about myself and I, and I understood my limits better than I guess for somebody who's starting this, who's like, who's like 25 or 30, that's, that's uh, then you, mm. you know, you haven't come to the conclusions about yourself, but I was a little bit lucky in that sense, but I, I really also, I acted on it and, and I just uh, fairly quickly understood what I should do and what other people should be doing. And I, I and I, then I went out and proactively looked for people to fill those positions. And I, I think that's um, that's something that that a lot of founders do. They they try to stretch themselves too much in into various things that they think they can do, but actually it would be better if other people do it. But then on the other hand, I actually got pretty lucky because this this uh, CEO thing that I did uh, turned out to be quite successful. And it's that's a really mm-hmm. difficult hire because like you have you hear so many stories of you getting the external CEO and it doesn't friggin work. It's like it, this. It's an absolute disaster, and it's almost it almost wrecks the company because then that person needs to leave and wants their shares back, and you need to pay them out, and then you get into this financial problem, and, and so you can get into all kinds of trouble. So uh, I usually say that I'm I'm the I'm I suck at recruiting because I I I'm very <laughs> I, I it's like. I only get like the Nobel Prize winners or the or the total like uh, train wrecks. It's like I, nothing in between. It's like it's either stellar or disaster. So I was <laughs> I, I was lucky this time. I yeah. 
So, but that that's that I think was um, that that was actually a very very important part of the, the on my recipe for success, to to see your limit, to act on it, and get some other people in to help you with with complementary competencies. By outsourcing that part, um, um, what were you doing on a day to day basis? I was still uh, doing the thought leadership thing. So I was I was the external face of the company. And, uh, and, uh, okay. and and so and and then people would perceive me as the CEO for years and years and years. I started the company close to thirteen years ago now, and I've not been the CEO yeah. for nine. An important part of that it was it was very very clear between us what the roles were. So Magnus, he would we we'd go in a meeting, and he would say like, yeah. you, you know, look, you know what? I'm just the CEO. It's like it, I could be anybody. Like anybody can do this. It's like anybody who I'm just a kind of general manager type. So. Like any general manager type that, that does it could do this job. But the guy you really should pay attention to is John because what he does is unique. So uh, so, so that's that's why we are in this room. I basically, I would send you an offer. I would staff the project. Anybody could do this. And uh, But but pay attention to John. So so I think that it also by, it was, it was very wise of him to kind of downplay his own role because a lot of people when they're the CEO, they would really want to, they want to shine. They want to be on stage. They want to be the, the yeah. face of the company. But it was a, it was a, it was a mutual understanding between us. It was for the benefit of both of us that I had the ex, uh, that I remained the, the external face. I remained like the conversion guy when he was the one like yeah. sending in, sending invoices and staffing and so. On. And he was ever so happy with that, as as far as I understand. Uh, uh, maybe we'll take a few beers and he'll pull out some grudges. I don't know, but I haven't heard that yet. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it's a bit shine, but I, I guess I guess that uh, maybe you know you <laughs> had to find a CEO that uh, didn't have too much ego uh, in, in the game. Um, yes, and uh, that leads us to the final point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, as as I wrote, build today for what you want to create tomorrow. So I, I let let me let us take both this down to a, like a very concrete example. Like after Magnus joined, when we were like five people. Like one of the, uh, not actually the first one, but before we were 10 people, we hired yeah. a full-time HR recruiting manager. And you know what? He's still with the company. So we th- like, wow. what, sane, what sane company would have a full-time recruiter and, and an HR manager when you're 10? It's like, no, that doesn't happen. That, that, <laughs> that comes sounds, when you're like 20, 30. That sounds 50. insane. Yeah. So, but that's basically, we were thinking like, we want to build this to like a 50 plus people uh, company. So uh, we yeah. could use like the, the downside of working with external recruiters is that they also, they don't have the empathy. They don't understand your business and you're building, you're building a new business, which basically nobody understands. So if you want to do like serious high quality recruiting, you need a recruiter that is, that is, that really knows what you're doing and have, and can have empathy for your business. So, and, so we know. So we basically said to ourselves, like, yeah, we're gonna. This is, of course, is a, um, is it might be a, a, a losing proposal in in the first stages here, uh, because like if we just look at the cash flow part part of it, it's going to be cheaper to do this like with an external recruiting agency for this year and the next year and possibly even the next year after that. But that's not why we're doing it. We're not doing it in the most cost efficient way. We're doing it in the in the in the way. That we think we'll be able to get the best recruits, and we lay the foundation for like long-term growth. So that's that's why we that's why we did this. And and I think that if I had a you know I never had an external board at this we have now, um, uh, but uh, but I didn't have it at the time. And I think if, if I had a board that does you know just looking at the EBIT and the uh, roadmap and so on, I I I, I just think that people would not have approved this. They, they would have said, John, this is too much money. It's like, it's going to, is this going to weaken your cash flow? This is not a good thing to do. You should go with the external recruiting agency. So, so there, there were a couple of things like that when we were, we were, we were always thinking like we, we, we need, everything we do, we need to think a couple of years ahead. Like when we're going to be double the size of we, mm. what we are now, when we're going to have these type of clients. So, so, so for example, one of the things that, when we put processes in in place, when we were doing this, these like conversion audits, conversion reviews, like we had, we had, like, we have always had like seriously good people and they were, they were really good at what they're doing. So I see a, a consultant doing like a conversion audit, giving it to the client. I, I review it and I see, and then I typically said like, 
everything you did in this in this document is so good it's really good so everything that's in mm. here is very good the only problem is that this thing isn't in there and also this thing is not in there and the third thing that isn't in there is this so you basically miss these three points so that's we quite early then develop these templates and checklists just so that we can get completeness in in the work that we've been doing and then we also instituted this system of we call it the granddad or grandmother so uh um basically the the, the boring word for this is qa right so so everybody that that was doing a piece of work also had this senior colleague that would have a second look at everything we ship so and that's why we is this important today with a kind of is, this is an extra cost this is an extra step extra layer is this important in terms of quality assurance for the clients that we have now today that we are shipping tomorrow no maybe not is it going to be important for the kind of clients we are getting in one two three years time yeah sure very important so let's do it now that's uh that's that's a really good takeaway i think i mean it's, uh, what's that saying um go to where the hockey puck is going to i think it was yeah yeah don't 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 don't, don't, don't go where the hockey puck is go where it's going yeah yeah, Wayne Gretzky, yeah. right? Like, yeah. uh, it's very yeah. hard to like think that that forward because I mean, putting myself in your shoes, you're at the ten person mark. You want to hire a full time HR person, which sounds absolutely crazy from a cash flow perspective. Um, did you just? But I mean, could you see in the numbers? And without, without going into details, could you see in your numbers, your financials, that you're growing at a certain pace? Um, you know, acquiring a certain amount of customer, more customers per year, and so forth, and bringing in more revenue you could see the trend lines that uh, mm -hmm. it made sense to hire this person like did you was there some like logical um data driven rationale behind this well, the, the, the rationale was basically we were uh we, we looked at it and we were basically seeing like this is how much money we're losing on this so this so this is yeah. right now so this is the negative effect on our cash flow right now can we survive that yes we can because we so if it's if it's not bad and worse enough worse than we can actually take it today then then um then basically we we think it's worth it it's an investment for the future so yeah and uh, you know to be honest it wasn't it's like it's pretty expensive too to work with an external recruiting agency so if you are recruiting at a high pace actually the 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 the, the payback is comes quicker than you than you think but it just it just seems it doesn't make sense but if you look at the numbers, mm. it actually it's it's it, it adds up pretty quickly. So, oh yeah, I mean if they're taking like I don't know about you, but in Australia, I think it's maybe I think I heard they take maybe ten or fifteen percent of a full year salary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for an employee, which is quite high. Like so, you're yeah. you know if you're if you're if you're accelerating if you're acquiring you know more employees at a certain pace, it's it's going to add up at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, so that's t that, that's a ten points. Uh, yeah, we're at the bottom of the list. <laughs> very much. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's good. It's it's. I'm 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 um I I I found this really insightful. And would you have any final takeaways for our audience, um, but specifically those who are thinking of setting up their own agency in the future? Yeah, I don't know if I would if I try to extract everything from this. It's like yeah. Mm. Uh, like I said, is there, so, there was a lot of gut feeling in this. Don't be afraid to go with your instincts. Don't be afraid to go against the, the, the convention and the norm of how you should be doing things. But then also, like if you just do that blindly and, you, and yet, then they don't reflect, because what I'm doing now is I'm reflecting on the things that I've done. So you try to extract, like, I did this thing. I had no idea what I was doing. But now it seems like it, this is how it, um, uh, this is how it actually seemed to be working, because now as I have kind of made these things explicit, now we are talking about these things inside the company. And now it helps us on the next uh, step is like, because now these implicit things become explicit and then people can understand, oh yeah, okay, it's that principle. Okay, let's, uh, we'll follow that. That, 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 that has helped us before, that's gonna help us in the future. So it's kind of a two-step approach. Like first, first go with your instincts, yeah. then reflect, extract the, the explicit things that you actually did and then, and then keep building on that. Awesome. Well, um, thanks very much for being on the podcast. Uh, maybe wow. in five years' time, um, you'll talk about the next 10 
<laughs> the ten <laughs> secrets of um, building your company even even bigger than it is before. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast, John. Yeah. Uh, it's it. been good having Love you. It. And yeah, next time, catch you around. Okay. Okay. Bye.